Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to the All Souls Community Forum coming from All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City. I'm Joe Robertson, a member of this church and also a member of the Forum Committee, a forum that for decades has carried on important conversations promoting critical thinking on the most compelling and challenging issues of our day. Today, we are examining critical race theory and America's fractured reckoning with history. And we're here with UMKC professor, Dr. Lois Carruthers and Dr. Brad Puth, the associate director of UMKC's Institute for Urban Education. And both of you, among your many specialties that focused on race, class, language, and social justice education, and of course, our nation's struggle with CRT. So Lois and Brad, welcome to the forum and uh, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank Joe. you. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a professor of educational leadership policy and foundations at UMKC. I teach courses related to education administration and qualitative research. I also serve as coordinator of the educational doctorate program in PK-12 administration. I bring extensive experience in urban education over 40 years. I have been a teacher, a central office administrator, assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction. And for about nine years, I served as the director of race desegregation at McCrell, which is, was a, uh, well, still is a re regional lab funded by the US Department of Education. My research involves the social construction of urban schools with an emphasis on exploring phenomena related to race, class, language, gender, and other differences that may influence educators' beliefs and perceptions and ultimately their work in schools. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, uh, I'm Brad Poos um, and I'm uh, at UMKC as well with uh, Lois. Um, and, uh, we appreciate you having us this morning uh, to discuss a little bit uh, our work around critical race theory um, and critical scholarship. I think it's important to just make mention that Lois and I are not legal scholars. Um, and so we come at this, uh, at this work um, a little bit uh, differently. We're educators, uh, as Lois said, she's spent years and years in education. I too uh, have spent my career uh, 20 plus years in education as well, uh, in K-12 education and then now in higher education. Um, and we do identify as, as critical scholars. Um, our scholarship and research definitely has a critical lens. Uh, and we, um, even as of late, have adopted uh, kind of a critical race theoretical paradigm, particularly looking at black crit and black mattering in our exploration of schools as institutions. Uh, so we do, um, we certainly, uh, our, our work is critical in nature, uh, but I, I just wanted to make note that we are not legal scholars. And so uh, when we talk about critical race theory and the origins of critical race theory, uh, we really look to um, the legal field uh, for those, those origins. Um, and critical race theory ultimately is taught in law school. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's something to, to make note of as well. And something that we'll talk about, um, even though in mainstream media, uh, it's often portrayed that critical race theory is taught in our elementary and middle and, and high schools. Um, I am not aware of, I mean, it's, it, it's just not happening. Um, so I, I think that's something just to kind of hold on to. We'll be happy to entertain questions, but I think um, we had discussed possibly doing that at, at the end. So if you have a question, please make note of that. Uh, and we'll certainly um, uh, come back to those questions at the end here, but we'll kind of push through kind of a little bit of what critical race theory is, a very brief history, uh, the major tenets, uh, some of the spinoff 
um, of, of uh, critical race theory, including black crit, uh, which Lois and I um, often employ in our work. Uh, and then talking a little bit about the, the contemporary um, issue of CRT in the media uh, and, um, and what, what's been happening there. Um, uh, so, I'd, like to, yeah. I'd like to add, Brad, before you leave that topic, that uh, many of my uh, doctoral students are introduced to critical race theory for the first time. And, um, you know, you're exactly right. It's much more of a, a focus area of higher education and helping educators be aware of some of those issues as they do their work in schools. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good point. You'll, you'll see here that um, we have pulled uh, just a brief definition of, of critical race theory and, and framing it as more of a, a movement. Uh, certainly you'll see it in scholarship, uh, but it's also a collection of not only scholars, but activists. But at its core, uh, CRT is, uh, and so and we should mention too, that we'll refer to critical race theory kind of henceforth as CRT. Uh, just as an abbreviated form of that, you'll hear that often uh, used um, widely as well. And we'll, we'll, so just, just, uh, just so we're all on the same page. But at its basic, uh, the basic premise, at its core, it's really arguing against the slow pace of racial reform uh, coming at um, uh, uh, racism as, as normal uh, in American society, that it's systemic. There's also an underlying critique of, of liberalism, uh, and we'll talk more about that, but that basically is getting at the, uh, at the concept that's used in critical race theory called interest convergence. Um, and we'll talk more about that here momentarily. And uh, ultimately it's about truth telling. Um, and that's kind of our approach to this is we want to explore uh, the truth. Um, and um, that's uh, in a nutshell, kind of what uh, CRT is, is all about. Brief history, uh, the, the guy you see on your screen here, uh, Dr. Derek Bell, uh, is really known as the grandfather of uh, critical race theory. Developed in the 1970s um, and was uh, kind of a, came as a result of what critical, Derek Bell, as well as others, uh, Freeman and Delgado. More recently, Kimberly Crenshaw is, um, is a, a, a notable name in this work. Um, but it, uh, it really came about from what is often called critical legal studies, uh, which basically uh, came at the study of law uh, as apolitical uh, or, or um, uh, not objective. Uh, and so kind of grew out of that as well as radical feminism. Um, so it's, it's both an outgrowth of critical legal studies, but taking it further. Um, and so it really, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at CRT, you sort of have to go back to critical legal studies to find, it, find its origins. And ultimately it's concerned with redressing historical uh, harms uh, or wrongs uh, that have been done historically. So there's also a historical element here. Much of the work that Lois and I do um, is historical in nature. Um, so uh, we sort of consider ourselves uh, in, in, as educational historians, but also counter storytelling is kind of what we, uh, is what we do. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here uh, too. I'm gonna let uh, Lois talk about how this has morphed into education and other related fields. Well, in the early 90s, you've had Lassen, Billings and Tate, and they used CRT to examine educational policies and practice within schools pertaining to communities of color. They were really interested in looking at equity issues in terms of children in urban schools and other settings, as well as suburban schools regarding curriculum 
assessment and instruction. So they began to look at CRT and apply it in that area in terms of bringing awareness to educators around issues of equity and social justice. Yeah, so just to give you an example of kind of applying a critical uh, race theoretical lens to uh, work in education, uh, Lois and, and I and, and uh, an, another co-author of ours just uh, completed a manuscript looking at um, Black mattering uh, and um, restorative justice in schools. Um, so looking at uh, zero tolerance policies and punitive measures that have been employed in schools historically in, over the last three decades that have uh, disproportionately impacted uh, students of color, particularly black students. Um, and so that's just sort of an example of applying that critical lens mm -hmm. in, uh, in education. Um, and, and all of the research that we've done is really in that education field um, and, and, students, uh, and students bring those experiences into classrooms and oftentimes teachers do not know how to address those experiences and so our work uh, centers around helping them to address some of the issues that from our larger society dealing with racism sexism and other differences that students bring into schools and they want to be able to talk about some of those issues and so breaking that silence. Mm -hmm. So this leads into uh, the basic tenets of CRT. And one of those that we really utilize widely um, is counter storytelling. Um, and that's a big part. Narrative storytelling and counter storytelling are, um, that's a big part of critical race theory. Lois, did you want to say a little bit more about counter storytelling or do you want to come well, back to it? Well, I'll go ahead and mention it. You know, there in, in terms of counter storytelling, it's the focus on resisting these master, master narratives. So there are three types of stories. There are personal stories regarding racism and sexism. People often tell other people's stories or narratives using the third person. And then there are narratives created by authors to explore the intersectionality of um, various forms of subordination. So we're going to be telling a couple of counter stories. I will be telling a story of personal racism and sexism. And Dr. Poos will tell the third type of story in, in terms of looking at other people's uh, narratives regarding subordination and intersectionality. So we'll come back to that here in a moment, uh, but just to touch on some of the other basic tenets. Um, one is that racism is permanent. It's ordinary, I mentioned that earlier, uh, but coming at racism as the common everyday experience of most people of color in the United States, uh, as well as the usual way that society does business. So this sometimes is, we can refer to this as whiteness as status property. Um, and that's um, something that Latson, and Billings and Tate who really apply this to education have uh, discussed in their look uh, and insight into educational in inequities. Um, but this notion that uh, whiteness has uh, meaning uh, in our in, in American society, uh, both historically as well as contemporary meaning. Um, interest convergence is a concept I mentioned earlier as well. Um, interest convergence um, is really this idea that black people in particular, but people of color achieve civil rights victories only when white and black interests converge. Um, so uh, typically, uh, we'll see that progress is made uh, when it benefits uh, both white and people of color. So that's the notion of interest convergence. Um, the social construction of race is, is critical to, to understanding CRT. Um, and that's the, that's the idea that, that, um, that there, 
there's no objective truth really that um, there's no biological or genetic reality to um, racial superiority. Uh, races are categories. They've been socially invented. They're manipulated. They're, they change over time. Um, at, at one point, uh, it will benefit a, a, a particular um, race and harm another um, and can, can shift and adjust depending on uh, the contemporary uh, moment. Um, and so this idea of race as a social construct, that it's been created by society and not rooted in objective fact, uh, is uh, uh, critical to the understanding of, of, of uh, CRT. And then lastly, this overarching critique of liberalism. And this, this was uh, when, when uh, CRT uh, really gained popularity in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Um, critique of liberalism was kind of a popular, uh, popular aspect of this particular movement, uh, attacking such things as colorblindness or neutrality of the law, or the, this idea of slow incremental change. Um, that was something that uh, crits uh, or those who were involved in CRT really took issue with. Um, but that's that's changed a little bit as of late, especially with um, with the movement towards uh, kind of broader conservatism around um, um, strict kind of right side politics. Um, and so now the, the, this idea of liberalism is sort of, I don't know, taking a backseat, I suppose, but that was originally uh, what uh, crits were were mainly concerned with. I want to go back to the counter storytelling now, um, and we'll share uh, examples. We were going to start with these, but decided to kind of hold off until we got to the basic tenets. Um, and we frame these as uh, these stories that we're going to tell. Just kind of frame these as statements of positionality, um, giving you an idea where we come from, how we approach this work. Um, and these are also examples of storytelling um, and how it's important in critical race theory. Lois, do you wanna start or do you want me to? Well, I'll, I'll start. You know, originally I, I was gonna follow you, um, yeah. but I'd be happy to start. Okay. Um, you know, as Dr. Poos mentioned, uh, these stories are just a part of us. And so I cannot grow up I, I would not be able to grow up in America without realizing that what I represent as an African-American woman. I am the great granddaughter of Elizabeth Furlow, born in slavery, the granddaughter of Pinky Furlow Mitchell, identified as mulatto in the 1920 census, the daughter of Ethel Mitchell Jordan, whose father was killed by two white men in the 1920s and his body left in a field of rural Arkansas. I am the daughter of the Mansi Joyner, veteran of World War I and II. The Mansi was in Bravo Company, 813 Pioneer Infantry Regiment in World War I, and dug more ditches than actively fought because the Pioneer Regiments were formed to serve as road maintenance troops and often used as labor for anything that needed to be accomplished. I was raised by a single parent with eight siblings when my father died in the early 50s. I was five years old. Shortly after his death as a result of the 1950s polio epidemic, I was diagnosed with polio and eventually quarantined in the segregated hospital of Kansas City for Black people, General Hospital Number 2, once located on Hospital Hill in the vicinity of Truman Medical Center. I was one of 10 of 15 black children who integrated Purcell High School in 1961. And by 1967, the school was predominantly black due to white flight. I was part of the system that Dr. Poos will talk about that has to be torn down. My tears flowed unchecked as I stood in the slave castles of Ghana in 2009, still smelling the remains of the blood and urine of my ancestors. Our silence about the past perpetuates a form of symbolic violence that extends beyond physical acts to include the social origins of physical conflict 
used according to Bruin and Raymond to maintain, as I quote, systems of oppression and domination within the context of a hegemonic society. We use our constructive knowledge of self and our positionalities to challenge the backlash against critical race theory, theory often misunderstood. As Dr. Poos mentioned, CRT began as a form of protest against an unjust legal system. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Poos, to tell your story. Thanks, Dr. Carruthers. And as Dr. Carruthers mentioned earlier on, <clears throat> uh, my statement is, is, is uh, a little bit framed a little bit differently in looking at my position within a larger system, uh, not so much on my personal experiences, but how I see myself in this system. Whereas Dr. Carruthers was, was more a personal narrative around her, uh, in her experiences. So I would like to refer to the late John Ogbu, anthropologist who coined the phrase, quote, involuntary minorities, in reference to those whose group belonging is rooted in a history of conquest, colonization, and or enslavement. In particular, I would like to acknowledge that we gather in this space today on the stolen lands of indigenous and First Nations peoples, Kanza, Kickapoo, Osage, Otis, Missouri, Potawatomi, and others. I want to recognize as well those who were enslaved over the centuries long system of black chattel slavery and who were forcibly transported to North America as part of the transatlantic slave trade and whose shackled labor is largely responsible for building the country we refer to as the United States. I wanna call your attention to specifically my positionality in this system as a white man whose ancestors were responsible for perpetuating these egregious and heinous acts. I come before you in this moment to commit to being part of the solution. This is not and has never been a burden to bear by those who have and continue to be victimized by the system of racial inequity and whose full humanity cannot be fully realized until historical harms have been meaningfully addressed. We all have a role to play in tearing down this system, but that responsibility falls heavily on those who are and whose ancestors were part of the dominant group. Those of us who are white, those who look like me. So those are examples of statements uh, of positionality, but um, also more broadly storytelling uh, as a powerful way to not only position ourselves in this work, um, but to also provide an example of how storytelling can be both extremely powerful and meaningful um, and can bring new understanding and new meaning uh, to, to, uh, to this long, uh, long age-long problem, centuries-long uh, problem uh, and issues of, of racial inequity uh, in, uh, in this country. And being gonna... able to break that silence as well, Dr. Coos, is also healing. Uh, I never thought that I would be able to tell that story publicly. Uh, my niece has been doing some research in terms of our families and uh, been able to, let's say, speak of horrific kinds of issues. Um, sort of breaks that silence and is also healing at the same time. Yes. Okay, well, um, we're gonna move on now to, so we can get through some of, of this uh, other information uh, regarding CRT before we come back to questions. I uh, just wanna make a note that um, when we think of racism as endemic, uh, in, in the United States. A lot of times uh, when we think of this idea of critique of liberalism, we return to the election of Barack Obama um, and the notion that 
uh, Ray says that that the election of of President Obama was an indication that um, racism was declining uh, in this country. Um, you know, it's apparent at this point, I think, that uh, that's no longer uh, the case, uh, nor was it ever. Um, but I, I pulled a quote here from Delgado and Stefankic, who are uh, prominent CRT theorists, that by every social indicator, racism continues to blight the lives of people of color, including those uh, holders of high echelon uh, jobs. Um, with regard to liberal, with uh, um, liberalism, many liberals, we, we mentioned this idea of colorblindness and neutral principles of constitutional law. CRT really takes aim at both of those, um, both this idea of colorblindness or the fact that race doesn't matter, um, that anyone, this the idea of the myth of meritocracy that Dr. Crothers, I think we'll talk about here in a moment, but that anybody can be successful, just, you know, uh, harness your efforts, pull your bootstraps up and go. Um, and that's, that's one of this, I, you know, that's one of the, the concepts around liberalism is that anybody can be successful. Um, and this belief in equality, especially equal treatment for all persons, regardless of their different histories uh, or, or current situations. Um, and this plays into this idea that, um, that kind of convincing ourselves that the election of Barack Obama meant that we had arrived at a post-racial stage of social development. Um, and I think that we um, can certainly make the case that now, um, in this moment, that that certainly is not, is not true. Um, Dr. Crothers, did you wanna talk a little bit about this idea of meritocracy and- Absolutely, you know, we have what's called neoliberalism, the idea that the market controls everything. And in terms of meritocracy, there are a number of Black youth uh, and others as well who uh, represent what we're calling Black resiliency neoliberalism. It represents bold efforts of Black people to thrive against anti-Black structural racism. You'll see this reflected in narratives of individual Black youth who wish to overcome conditions of poor schools, outdated books, and living in poor neighborhoods. They do so by staying in school, getting good grades, staying out of trouble, and attending college. And so this whole idea of this Black resiliency neoliberalism has affected the lives of all of us, uh, built on the idea of meritocracy if you'll just work hard enough, you'll be able to overcome some of these structural issues of racism. And that's also rooted in the highly individualistic nature of the United States, uh, this, this idea of individualism uh, versus collectivism, where we often in the United States in particular, this, the social structure is at the individual level. Uh, that, you know, make something of yourself, which gets into this idea of meritocracy, too. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Carruthers uh, take this uh, and talk a little bit about some of the spin-offs of um, critical race theory uh, that we, we currently see in, in the literature. Well, given the idea that race affects all of us, you know, I often say we cannot grow up in America without being racist, sexist, or some type of binary dealing with issues of differences. Uh, but in responses to the structural determinism, uh, CRT in its very beginnings represented this black white binary. In other words, we only talked about race. And so there were a number of scholars that began to look at the experiences of other groups for instance, uh, Crenshaw introduced the term uh, intersectionality, the fact that we are just not one shape, we're not shaped by just one experience or one experience. Our lives are shaped by the interlocking of experiences. 
were shaped by race, class, gender, sexual, sexuality, able-bodiedness, and age. Uh, as a result of this Black-white binary, the responses of Asians uh, was the notion of Asian crit. It's a framework that theorized Asian Americans' racial realities, including the exclusion of a national identity, uh, are concerns of this group, or were concerns and still remain concerns. The whole idea of the model minority myth, which sort of sets Asian Americans against the struggles of other people of color, and overall having the construction of a collective historical narrative. Then you have emerging from critical race theory, black crit, and it's, it emerges as a theory of blackness to confront anti-blackness. The idea that anti-blackness is embedded in a theory of Afro-pessimism that insists black people exist in the imagination of the slave. A theory that insists that black is a despised thing in and, of, in and of itself in opposition to all that is pure, humane, human, and white. And then you had lat crit that emerged in the early uh, 90s, 1995, by scholars who wanted to use the foundation of critical race theory to address the inequities that Latinx people felt. These inequities do, due to race, class, gender, and sexuality related to immigration status, language, ethnicity, and culture. And then there was a notion of what we call queer theory that focused on sexuality and the normalization of sexuality in our society as a heterogeneous kind of a narrative. Uh, queer crit began to apply jurisprudence and critiques of the intersections of race and sexual orientation for people of color to examine how anti-racist literature and the movements marginalize their concerns and perspectives. The other response to this black and white binary was tribal crit, which highlights racism specific to indigenous people, problems of assimilation, centrality of sovereignty and self-determination and the importance of tribal philosophies and traditions. And so you had, as I mentioned, uh, several responses to that black white binary that we created uh, in the larger society where we only looked at race in terms of black, blackness and whiteness. So as we think about how CRT has, has grown, this notion of intersectionality, these spinoffs uh, that are, are more inclusive of the whole human experience in, in the United States, um, we find that critical race theory has become a little bit more mainstream, <laughs> um, whereas you know, nobody was talking about critical race theory two years ago or three years ago. Now uh, it's hard uh, to avoid uh, turning on, on the news um, and, and hearing something about uh, critical race theory. I thought it was interesting. There was an article in the, in the uh, Washington Post uh, over, well, in June of 21. Um, so uh, not, not too terribly long ago. Um, and the title of the article was uh, Republican Spurred by an Unlikely Figure, See Political Promise in Targeting Critical Race Theory. Uh, and the, the, this originated with this gentleman you see here on the screen, Christopher Rufo, uh, who is a um, former documentary filmmaker, actually worked at PBS, um, turned conservative activist. And if you just Google his name and, and look him up, you'll find several interviews uh, with him on mainstream media, not, not just Fox, but MSNBC and others where he has been asked about his role in uh, advancing the notion that critical race theory is uh, threatening um, uh, the 
institutions, uh, particularly federal institutions of, of our government. Um, the story goes that, um, that former President Trump was watching Fox News and Christopher Rufo came on discussing critical race theory, uh, describing it as um, a default ideology of the federal bureaucracy being weaponized against the American people and betting all sorts of uh, different aspects of the federal government. Uh, and and uh, it was not long thereafter that President Trump initiated his uh, executive order. Um, and I remember this kind of coming down the pike here at UMKC and the work that we were doing where this became sort of real world, where um, uh, in the last days of the, of the Trump presidency, uh, that uh, because of this executive order that there, we were having conversations even at, at uh, our level about um, what we could or could not say. Um, and so the, the kind of the trickle down. Uh, Rufo has described CRT, critical race theory, as cult indoctrination. And on his Twitter account, he wrote uh, in March of 21, Quote, we have successfully frozen their brand critical race theory into the public con uh, conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We, ev we will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under the brand category. Um, and so um, just a point of reference uh, that um, this was the approach uh, and so the, the shift for, for CRT from, um, from liberalism, neoliberalism to kind of in your face conservatism now being the major threat uh, to, uh, to critical race theory uh, certainly um, is, is sort of the reality in this, in this moment. And this has consequences. Um, and so, um, Oh, I, I forgot to put this in there. I'll read this to you. CRT does not attribute racism to white people as individuals or even to entire groups of people. Simply put, critical race theory states that U.S. social institutions, the criminal justice system, education system, labor market, housing market, healthcare system are laced with racism bed, embedded in laws, regulations, rules, and procedures that lead to differential outcomes by race. And really what the case that Rufo and some of these other conservative uh, think tankers are, are really um, going after is that CRT attributes all racism uh, to white people. Um, and that is certainly not what the uh, theory is about. Uh, it's about truth telling, as we mentioned early on, it's about exploring the systemic nature of racism and the fact that racism and race uh, is endemic to the United States, et cetera. Um, but this is what, this is what uh, has, this is how this has been framed by some of these um, conservative pundits to, uh, to, to make CRT all about the fact that it's, you know, theorizing that white people um, uh, that that racism is attributable to white people, and and, and, that's and what's what's interesting too, just to add to that, uh, Dr. Coos is also, you know, we had all of these different crits that emerged as a result of people wanting to tell the truth about their conditions. There's also a crit called parent crit, and so there are lots of reactions to this binary of whiteness and blackness in our society. And people simply simply want to be able to tell their stories and to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. In terms of where this has brought us to this moment, um, we have nine states, Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Arizona, and North Dakota, who have uh, passed legislation banning uh, or restriction, restricting the teaching of critical race theory. Um, we have um, 
as you can see by this map, uh, there are new bills that have been introduced, including in uh, Missouri around uh, limiting or banning or restricting uh, discussions um, around racism uh, and, and or critical race theory. Uh, there are uh, just a couple of states where critical race, uh, racism bans have failed. Uh, you can see there Arizona and, and, uh, and, and Mississippi. Um, and only one uh, state, Delaware, that has reaffirmed its teaching of, of Black history and anti-racism. This map's kind of hard to see. And then quite a few states that have not taken any action. But I think, obviously, the fact that nine states to this, to this, uh, um, in, in this moment have either banned or restricted um, the teaching of, of critical race theory or of, of systemic racism uh, is disconcerting, uh, certainly. We and, did, as we, and as yeah. we talked about this issue, Dr. Poots, if you uh, kind of recall some of our earlier conversations, you know, this fear is just um, kind of uh, what I would call uh, ridiculous. I mean, even if you look at what's going on in six through 12 schools in terms of social studies, uh, these standards that we have here have no mention of critical race theory. Um, and so, uh, as you mentioned, it is a uh, fear going out of uh, white supremacy and all of the other things that have been going on in, in our society regarding uh, race. Yeah. Uh, elementary kids are not exposed to critical race theory, not even at the high school level are students exposed to critical race theory. It's such a complex and abstract idea in the first place, but there mm -hmm. are standards around examining social structures and stratification in terms of societies and the relationships between people. Uh, standards around looking at key events of continuing US movements to realize equal rights for women and other groups or other people of color. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, there's so much being talked about critical race theory and exploring systemic racism that um, I, I think we're finding too that teachers are, are, you know, they're hearing this as well. And there's fear there. Uh, what can I say? What can't I say? Um, can we talk about systemic racism? Can we talk about some of these really important, meaningful issues? Um, and, um, you know, the fear that, uh, that there's going to be some sort of consequence, either federal or state level consequence for, for those conversations is impact, is indeed impacting the curriculum. But there's nothing in these standards uh, at these are, I mean, these are mis Missouri grade level expectations and part of the standards for uh, Missouri schools. I mean, there's nothing in there about critical race theory, but I think obviously uh, we're concerned that all of this rhetoric uh, and what's happening with banning and restricting critical race theory is that now these conversations are being limited in our schools um, and they're, you know, they're, they're not happening as a result um, of, of that. And then what does this really do for our children in terms of teaching them about equity, democracy, and those things that we want them to hold on to as they become adults and leaders in our society? Mm -hmm. And this dominant narrative that's being pushed by um, those uh, in, in, the, in the stratosphere here who are discussing the dangers of critical race theory really speaks to one of the core elements of CRT, which is that objective truth doesn't exist. Uh, and that truth is a social construction, uh, as is race, uh, and it's created to suit the purpose of the dominant group. Um, and as we see these discussions happening more widely, I think this is a great exemplar of the fact that truth is a social construction uh, and being used by uh, this, this creation of, of, um, of kind of subjective truths uh, becoming the dominant narrative 
um, and and is is impacting uh, all of us um, in what we hear in in the media um, and how, what we hear now even in in some some of our schools where teachers are fearful of 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 truth telling. Um, Dr. Crothers, anything to to follow? Well, there's just a there's just a comment in the uh, chat, and I think that that is certainly true. Uh, why are race and racism given to be interchangeable when in fact they are two different concepts? One component of race is skin color, which science tells us it is one. It is a natural response to sunlight, sunlight to protect the body. It is racism that is taught and it is racism that is the problem. And I will certainly agree with that comment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop our screen share. Thank you, uh, Lois and Brad. Yes, uh, and we have, we will get to questions here. We have been listening to Dr. Lois Carruthers and Dr. Brad Poos from the University of Missouri in Kansas City, and we're talking critical race theory. And before we get to questions, I also want to tell you about next, next Sunday's forum. So tune in next week on this same Zoom channel and hear Leonard Zeskin, author and founder of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. And, and we will look at a post, and as we look at a post Charlottesville, post January 6th insurrection world, you'll be tackling the questions, how can white supremacists be stopped? So uh, here we go, uh, Lon, you're up. All right, the question is gonna be a curveball, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Why is the US military so integrated compared to any other institution in the United States of America? That is a real interesting question. And, uh, you know, when you think about the military, they started that integration early on. Uh, matter of fact, my son is a uh, retired military and he's been very helpful in sharing some of these issues uh, with me. Um, I think in terms of, uh, it was so integrated early on because as America, we were interested in protecting our country, so we almost had to integrate the military. I don't know what your response would be to that, Brad, but that was certainly- Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think if we, we look historically, you, know, you take World War II, for example, right, where um, we can even go back to the Civil War, where uh, certainly we had Black uh, soldiers uh, fighting in segregated units. Uh, true of, of civil or uh, World War II. I mean, we had segregated units. Of course, we had um, people of color, black in particular, but fighting in segregated units, returning to a uh, home country. Then, after fighting, uh, you know, off the evils of, of national socialism and. Um, uh, Hitler and, and uh, Nazi Germany, Mussolini, etc., and then returning to a, a home front where their work wasn't valued. I mean, I think, you know, you look at uh, the, the GI Bill and the fact that um, black and brown soldiers were not benefiting from, uh, from, uh, fr from aspects of that that GI Bill that favored and supported white returning soldiers. Um, so I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I mean, I'm not well, an expert. It was sort of like their bodies were used in wars, but they couldn't come home and find equal housing. Right. Uh, they were not a part of that GI Bill in terms of housing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, excuse me, that's not what I was asking. I know that it was integrated in 49, 48, and now it's become what I was asking. The idea is it's pretty integrated in the military as far as moving up the ladder and other ways of doing things. In other words, it's one of the few institutions in the United States mm -hmm. to, do the, to do that. And I wondered how that was affecting the critical racial theory of how to change a system. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think part of it is opportunity uh, as well. I mean, you talk about uh, integration of, of uh, the various armed forces. I mean, a lot of times uh, students of color who don't have opportunities as, uh, 
rich, as rich uh, of opportunities to attend four-year universities who are attending schools that um, systemically have have um, and systematically have have failed them. Those opportunities to uh, to join the the military is open to all uh, and become a uh, a transition into opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know that we're answering your question, but, um, uh, I, and I don't know that I really know the answer to that. I'm not a military historian, but, um, but I do, you, we did share a video um, where, um, uh, I think the discussion General, around, General yeah. Immediately at the, yeah. Uh, testifying with the Senate as to why the military, uh, was supporting CRT and the fact that uh, they felt that soldiers had to be aware of the history of this country and that they did not want to squelch that kind of a truth in terms of that. Okay, uh, Craig, Craig working. has a question. Craig, along, Craig has a question. Yeah, thanks so much for this presentation. I'm uh, really, it was very thoughtful and I'm all with you, but as it went along, I was, troubled by the use of all these acronyms and uh, jargon in the explanation of this. Like uh, I can, for, are we playing into the hands of these right wingers? When we talk about, like, I can foresee them saying, well, uh, we're gonna be black mattered. Like you had black mattering, you know, yeah. or look out, the queer crits are coming for us. And I, I'm just suggesting that maybe we might need to quit using some of these words. It, it took me a long time to figure out what, what they meant. And that's, that makes us vulnerable to these guys who sit around all day thinking of ways to twist our words against us. So in, in other words, is it really necessary to be, can, can we make this a little more understandable? Yeah, well, you I mean, I think up, that's a good, that's a good point. A good Sorry, point. brothers, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that's a very good point, but you had scholars who began to meet as groups to begin to think about and try to sort out all of this. And so uh, you're exactly right. They coined a lot of phraseology in terms of trying to explain some of these issues. And so, uh, yeah, and then as educational theorists, we try to take some of that same language and apply it to what's happening in education. But in terms of many of the scholar uh, attempts of theorizing, uh, we do, as theorists, come up with ways of describing things that sometimes, or oftentimes, the public don't quite understand. And so we have to begin to translate those acronyms and that language into understandable language. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, for our purposes here, I mean, we sort of took a more academic tone um, just in describing and explaining and, and providing some history. Uh, so I, yeah, I think um, a point well taken, uh, and I think you're right. Um, I think that uh, the defense uh, against some of this conservative push to make CRT the boogeyman uh, needs to be simple, toned down, and and easy to understand. Um, and so I think certainly we would not take this uh, presentation on the road necessarily <laughs> in, or, in mass media. Um, but yeah, I think your your point is well taken. Thank you. And I would make you know Joe here the comparison to the same thing happened like with defund police. I mean it's like and and when you were talking in terms of using the term. Uh, uh, like counter storytelling, which uh, would be understood as being changing the, the what has been the misappropriation of the of the uh, misunderstanding of history, but all these things always seem to be um, it goes uh, against the idea. The idea comes up like it's being carried that becomes characterized as revisionist. These kind of things. So um, mm -hmm. I know you talk about truth telling. So I guess how how if an advertising marketing an agency or whatever were to take this over, what 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 would be the way to go? How do you get the you know the truth seems to be the thing we're after, but even that gets mis misunderstood. 
Well, truth it, from a constructivist standpoint, each each of us come with different truths. And so uh, I think that that's what we have to understand about life. Our experiences will uh, influence our truth. And so truth is much more of an individualized uh, construction rather than a collective construction. So I may tell the story one way and somebody else tells the story the other way, but I also have the right to my story. Okay, I, Carol, Carol has a question. And, yeah. Well, my question is from frustration. I mean, I, I'm seeing this Matthew Hahn who was fired in Tennessee and, and I'm looking at another screen that has a big flag, you know, education, not indoctrination, stop critical race theory now. All these states that are outlawing it, what happened to our, to our, the freedom, of the right to speech? Uh, I, I, I just, uh, how is this not being challenged and losing in the courts? Um, you know, why isn't this the swope monkey trials? It's, it's just crazy. And do you have any ideas on how to make this, fix this? That's my question. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that it's, it, you're right. Um, there's, uh, especially as we look at, you know, st state legislators, who are really taking this on and and um, and again this this fight for objective truth? You know, um, uh, I think this is a this is going to be this is going to be a, a a tough battle. Um, and uh, the more uh, we can get uh, information out about what critical race theory is uh, and the fact that that. Um, these, uh, this conservative movement is just blindly throwing everything in the CRT bucket. Um, you know, we, we have, we, we have to get uh, that information out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think it was also a reaction of, it, overall about our not wanting to talk about race. We are silenced about those issues and how race has um, influence our country and the fact that our country was built on racism. And so those are things that we want to silence. Instead, there's much more of a focus on a, uh, a narrative of white domination and hegemony. And so uh, people are not willing to bring in other voices. And so a lot of that uh, threatens this whole notion of freedom of speech. And uh, Karen and Chuck have a question. Um, I wanna get this clear for myself and for, for Carol who asks, I think I know where she's coming from. Critical race theory is not the same as teaching black history, correct? Correct. Because right. I know the, the schools that I've worked in, we talk about you know, Black History Month and all of that. So critical mm -hmm. race theory is, is systemic, correct? That's what they're not allowing people to talk about. That's right. right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Although, I mean, although I think uh, depending on where you are, you know, Black history is being, is being uh, thrown in with, in the CRT bucket. Uh, uh, and so yes. now anything around, any discussion around race. Difference, right. Any discussion uh, or, around yeah, or difference, difference uh, right. is, is now up for uh, criticism um, mm -hmm. because it's all being just thrown in the same bucket. Um, yeah. So you, you, that's, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you. In your, uh, in your, Edu you know, your school of education with, with teachers, do you have uh, advice for teachers, how they might confront their, their concerns, uh, what, they what, what boundaries they might be looking for and how they might cross them? 
Yeah. Um, you know, we, we work a lot with teachers around, uh, and, and part of, you know, in the Institute for Urban Education, what, what we're really charged to do is to, um, is to help prepare exemplary teachers for our urban schools. Um, and these sorts of uh, conflicts are commonplace now and difficult to navigate. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, I think it was, it, it's Bill Ayers talks about having one foot in possibility and one foot in reality. Um, you know, that's hard to straddle. Uh, but we certainly want our students and our teachers to be activists, uh, to, um, to be aware and, and cognizant of, 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 the, um, of, of the pushback that they're going to receive. Uh, but ultimately, we want them to be truth tellers. We want them uh, to be activists, community responsiveness, care for children of, of all uh, races, creeds, ethnicities, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, um, you know, sometimes these are tough, uh, tough calls that, that involve uh, specific uh, situations, but um, ultimately, that's that's what we're trying to to uh, to do is to create these teachers who are are able to navigate a really difficult uh, sea. Dr. Crothers, you have anything to add? Well, I just wanted to say when students bring these conversations up in schools, and they will bring them up from their communities and from social media and et cetera. You know, we want we don't want teachers to close these conversations down because. You know, we're building these critical kinds of uh, conversations about things that affect us as a nation. Um, I just talked to one of my students last night and um, most of, she teaches in a white suburban school and many of her students bring these issues uh, to her as a classroom teacher and she does not close those conversations down, but yet and still, you have to also, especially with this backlash, she's also very cognizant of how those conversations can be misconstrued. So it's a challenge for teachers uh, in terms of valuing the experiences that, ki that kids bring to school because they are going to bring uh, these experiences to schools and there are, they are gonna comment on these issues. I want to thank Dr. Lois Scruthers and Dr. Brad Poos for, for bringing us a fascinating forum here today. And uh, so, yeah, well, thank you again.